Hey everybody, this is Potential for FloatToTurn.com. Being my first video, I wanted to, to do something a little bit different, something that would stand out but also be very relevant to users of the site. Um, I realized for the most part that the videos on the site are geared towards hand histories, uh, basic strategy and theory, and then of course the webinars by Jonathan. So I thought that doing something that was more based off of not just playing the game, but also managing yourself, managing your bankroll, um, options for you if you want to become a professional, if you want to, or even if you just want to make money consistently. Um, so I had a lot of these things that I want, wanted to discuss that I thought would be very good for anyone who's wanting to turn poker from a hobby into something more consistent as far as making money. So as you can see, I'm just calling it playing poker professionally. Um, short, sweet, to the point. Um, and these are the topics I'm going to be covering. You know, I think that it's really, really, really important to treat and play poker as though it was any kind of job. You now that may, you now that kind of brings it from being fun and exciting to being a bit more boring, but you know, if you're just playing poker to have fun and to have some excitement, chances are you aren't going to be making much money. And if you want to start making a lot of money, you've got to take it seriously. Um, and I definitely think that one of the most underrated things in poker is having a great mindset. Um, not just emotionally as far as tilt control, but that's also really important, but also as far as goal setting, um, being balanced in life, you know, working out, having a social life, doing those kinds of things. Of course, the importances of volume, bankroll management, and game selection um, really can never be overstated. Um, I tend to tell friends of mine or students that I view essentially like volume and bankroll management and game selection being like equivalent to being a church. You know, volume is say God, bankroll management is Jesus, and game selection is the church. You know, without the three of them, you don't have Christianity, you know, just as a good example. Um, so they're definitely all three really, really, really needed if you want to make money consistently. I also want to discuss um, the backing and staking industry. I think either as a full-time player, as a part-time player, or even just as an investor, that there's a lot of money to be made in the backing and staking industries, either to be backed or to back others. Um, I did play a little bit in the United States online and live, and I feel that it'd be important to discuss the options that are available for American grinders, where people can play, um, what kind of deals they can get, those kinds of things, um, and where, it's, where it is safe to play. And having a bit of live experience, around a thousand hours or so of live cash grinding, um, I wanted to also cover uh, playing live professionally. Uh, playing live cash games, playing tournaments, those kinds of things. I thought it would also be important to discuss um, bankroll management for live, game selection for live, um, and any of anything else that would be important for live play. I'm sure the last part will apply to very few of you, but I also think that it's important to cover is moving out of the United States to get back into poker stars or party poker or, what, or wherever, um, and to continue playing poker professionally outside of the USA. Okay. You are your own boss. Uh, this can be a great thing or it can be a terrible thing. It's going to come down to who you are really as a person. If you're someone who is very self-motivated, this is going to be a great thing. Um, if you're someone who procrastinates a lot and can't stick to schedules and those kinds of things and think that poker is great for that, well, you know, you're going to find out pretty quickly that it's not. Um, and if you want to do some if you want to really turn the game from something where you can make some money into something where you can you know, do, do as a profession, you're 
going to need to change any bad habits that you have. You know, so you know, treat poker like work. Um, get ready in the morning. You know, brush and shave and shower every morning. Eat a healthy breakfast. Work out. Um, get yourself into the zone. You know, think go over hand histories. You know, any anything that you would necessarily need to do for a for a major intensive job, you should be doing for poker. As far as making sure that you're ready, focused, and you know, completely together. Um, it's also really important to have a schedule. Um, as far as if you decide to play certain games from certain time periods, s sticking to that will allow you to put in a lot more hours and stay motivated. Um, for instance, I tend to start at 260 uh, in the morning, $265 knockout. Um, then there are a couple other tournaments that I like to play as well. And then I also register to a certain point, and I stick to that schedule pretty much every day, except for certain days I switch it with it. This keeps me, you know, focused. It keeps me motivated, and I have a specific, you know, schedule that I can easily stick to. If you just like decide to play occasionally and play when you feel like it, you aren't really going to be putting in enough volume um, and getting in enough hours where you can make money consistently. So, last point: time management and money management are key. Um, and I don't mean money management as far as grinding, although bankroll management is absurdly important. I also mean money management in other aspects of your life. You know, if you only have like twenty thousand dollars to your name, you know, you shouldn't be spending a thousand dollars, you know, a month on eating out or whatever. Um, you shouldn't be spending four grand a month on rent. You know, you shouldn't be buying really expensive cars or TVs or whatever. You should be using your money and investing it as wisely as you can, not only in your life, but also in, in poker as well. And as you can see, mindset is everything. Um, mindset not just as far as emotional stuff, although tilting at the tables, tilting in any aspect of your life is, can be very, very, very damaging. Um, but also mindset as far as setting goals, having you know, having something you're working for. If, if you don't have something you're working for, you know, you can't really be m that motivated. Now, if you're just playing poker for fun and don't have a rhyme or reason to what you're doing, um, you aren't going to be putting up consistent results, you aren't going to be putting up volume. A good way to set goals is to think about where you want to be five years from now. So this would be this very long term. You know, five years from now, I'd like to be settled down in a house in a major American city with my boyfriend and have pets and be taking college classes and be on my own dime and, you know, be fairly well off financially and, you know, for all those things, for all those things to happen, I've also got to reach my long-term goal, which is um, maybe say a year from now, um, being on my own money, um, midterm, so let's say January, 100k profit on stars. Uh, short term, um, make coaching videos, get in coaching hours, um, make a podcast, uh, play thousand games on stars this next month, you know, those kinds of things. And very short term, doing things like, you know, just working out, and eating healthy, and being focused grinding, and sticking to a schedule, and you know, getting my first few videos finished on time, those kinds of things. So if you set goals where at least you're starting from the very long term, you have a very specific end goal in mind, you can start building towards that end goal. So I would try to think of where you'd want to be with poker at least um, in maybe not five years, maybe that might be too long for you, you know, for you at this aspect in your game, in your life, whatever, to, to try to think that long term, but at least try to think say a year from now. You know. Realistically, where would you want to be a year from now? Not, you know, pipe dream wise. Like, pipe dream wise, you know, two years from now, I want to be world champion. But that's not likely to happen. So, realistically, where, what, where do I want to be five years from now? Or, I guess, um, realistically, where do you want to be five years from now? As far as not 
still think very much about beats, you know, being able to take ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollar beats and only getting momentarily annoyed or you know, not letting it affect your game or the rest of your life is it's really important to have perspective, not just for poker, but for anything in your life. You know, like for instance Moving out of the United States and coming down to Mexico hasn't exactly been all that easy. You know, I have to be away from friends and family, um, have to be in a, in a country that isn't very safe, in a very small town where there's not much to do, um, it's hot and muggy all the time, and yada, 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 yada. Yeah, there are a lot of things at the moment that you know, could be going a lot better for myself, you know, losing thirty thousand dollars in September definitely hurt but you know I also have a lot of things in my life that are doing great you know for instance anytime I want I can have something simple like fresh water and food and I can have you know I have someone to share my life with um, who keeps me happy and motivated you know for every minor misstep in my life due to variance or whatever you know I've, I have so many things going for me that are great and you know, I just try to stay focused as far as what's good in my life and not what's bad. You know, at you know, any at any moment there's someone dying. There there are children dying from starvation, from dehydration, from you know, there's so many bad things going on in the world right now and you know, just think about how bad you could have it and how great you do have it right now. Um and you know, getting this kind of perspective and trying to always be happy no matter what happens, it definitely isn't easy. I mean, I'm a long ways from it. Uh, this last month was, you know, I was pretty close to being burnt out, um, running as bad as I did and putting in the amount of hours. It certainly isn't easy. But, you know, I can at least say at this point that I am happy with where I'm at, with what's going on. Um, and I'm able to stay motivated because of that. You know, I don't think about, oh, what's so bad. I just try to think about what's good, what I'm working for, and why I want it. And, you know, if this doesn't really help you have um, maybe a you know, tilt less or anything like that or have a better perspective of life, um, you really should look at, um, check out stuff by Tommy Angelo and Jared Tendler. They're absolutely amazing mindset coaches. Uh, Tommy Angelo has a book called Elements of Poker that um, it pretty much discusses in depth things like treating po um, treating poker like a job and having a good mindset and um, it, dealt, it talks a lot about mindset, it talks a lot about building your game so you have a very very solid game. Like, one of the things that I've been working on the most over the past year is getting to the point where no matter how tilted I am, no matter how annoyed I am, that my very worst poker game is still very profitable. And I don't want there to be much of a difference between my worst poker game and my best poker game. I need to play around the same most of the time. You know, if I let things outside of my life or variance oh, affect so me, good. it's going to cost me a lot of money. And finally, it's also really important to have a balance between poker and the rest of life. You now, if you're just sitting at home on your computer or going to the casino every single day and grinding, um, no matter how well you're doing, you, chances are you aren't going to be happy. Or if you are, it's not going to be for very long. Um, you know, sitting at your computer all day is very, very unhealthy, um, as phys physically and mentally. You know, poker's a very draining thing, so at the very least, you should have people who you talk to outside of poker that make, make you happy. You should have other hobbies, you should work out, you should try to eat healthy. If you're focused, if you're mentally happy, if you're physically happy, if you eat enough and sleep enough and work out and have balance between poker and the rest of life, there's no reason you can't achieve greatness in this game. Keys of grinding. Um, as you can see, my very first bullet, volume, volume, volume. Um, there, honestly, there really isn't anything much more important than volume. Um, in order to realize your potential, in order to realize the amount of money that each of your decisions should be making, you have to essentially outrun variance. 
Um, you have to play enough games that you achieve the long run and realize every dollar that you should be earning. Um, and I don't mean volume as far as playing hours, playing lots of hours, although that's really important as well, but also volume as far as playing a lot of tables. Um, if you aren't getting in lots and lots of games, it's going to be pretty easy for you to have losing months, yeah. losing quarters, even losing years. You know, you have to be playing lots and lots and lots of volume. Um, as a sit-and-go player, if you're playing mostly from, say, 9-mans to 180-mans, turbos and non-turbos, um, you should be aiming for at least 3,000 games a month. Um, and if you're playing mostly under 45-mans, at least five to 10,000 games a month. If you're focusing mostly on 180s and mixing in tournaments, um, you should be playing anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 games a month. And if you're playing specifically tournaments, you should at least be trying for 500 to 1,000 games a month, like dead minimum. Um, the amount of variance in all of those games are really, really, really high. In sit and goes, it's because you have a really, really small edge. Um, and in tournaments, it's because while you may have a really big edge, um, the amount of variance involved is so ridiculous due to how large the fields are that you've got to play a lot of volume. Um, and for cash games, you should be striving to play a lot of hands as well, at least 100,000 a month. Now, if you're doing this kind of volume for the game size you know, specified, it's going to be pretty rare to have losing sessions that are much longer than a month. Um, losing one to three months will happen pretty often, but you won't have losing years if you manage your money and manage yourself uh, correctly. Um, setup is important, and what I mean here is your playing setup. You know, having something like dual monitors, um, having using things like like Table Ninja, um, using you know hotkey managers. Right. Having a HUD and using that properly. Um, if you are live grinding, doing stuff like trying to live near where you're playing, um, having a good vehicle to get you there. You know, have a setup that, at least for online grinding, have a setup or try to that is poker dedicated. Um, as far as you only use that machine for poker and poker related things. Um, if you do have a setup like that, uh, you aren't very likely to ever get hacked. Um, you'll have a work computer and you know you have something that you dedicate to using towards work when you're on it. It'll help you stay more focused and keep you on your grind. Um, also something I think that's really important to mention is as far as setup is concerned is having an RSA token if it's possible. Um, it's while hacking is pretty rare, it does occur. And in fact, um, somewhat recently, like three to six months ago, Negreanu ended up getting hacked on Poker Stars and was hacked for over a hundred thousand dollars. And if Stars won't, you know, pay back the money that he lost because it was his responsibility. They aren't going to uh, look out really for you either. You know, the money that you have on your account, it's your responsibility to take care of it and to protect it and make sure that your account is safe. So having things like emails only for poker and having RSA tokens and making sure that no one knows what your poker email is, um, taking these steps will, make, will keep it pretty unlikely that you ever get hacked. Um, something that's also really important, of course, is managing your bankroll. Um, you, you really, really, really need to use proper bankroll management or you will go broke, 100%. Um, in fact, you can find tons of stories online about any of the big name pros going broke due to improper bankroll management. And there are rumors floating around of guys like Ivy being broke due to, well, not necessarily being for management poker, although I'm sure that's likely as well with the games he plays, but also just mismanaging his money outside of poker as well with, you know, gambling problems and those kinds of things. Um, as far as proper bankroll management is concerned, for something like 
sit and goes. Um, so nine mats and 45 mats, you should have at least a 300 average buying uh, poker roll specifically. So let's say I was a professional player and was playing nine to 18 man professionally and I was running a $30 average buy-in, I would have at least a $10,000 poker bankroll, poker specific. I would also have a bankroll set aside for six months to one year living expenses expenses in full. Now, let's say I was playing 45 mans to 180 mans. Um, I'd want at least a 500 to 1,000 average buying poker bankroll. So if I was grinding a $15 average buying, playing the $15 180s on stars, um, I'd want to have at least anywhere from $7,500 to $15,000. That was my poker bankroll specific. And then if I drop below a certain point, I would move down in limits. So say I hit $4,000, I'd move down to an $11 average buy or a $10 average buy. And for tournaments, um, the same thing is you should have at, at least a 500 average buy in poker bankroll for tournaments. And if possible, you'd have a 1,000 average buy in or greater bankroll. Now, being a back player, I don't really have to worry about having a specific bankroll for games. However, what I do have to worry about is how deep in makeup I get. So what I end up doing is as I get really deep in makeup due to running bad and playing bigger games, um, in order to prevent myself from falling too deep into makeup, I cut out certain games and lower my bearings. While this may be hurting my hourly long run, short run, it's going to lower my variance, it'll keep me in a positive mood and I'll be, you know, I won't get super deep in makeup and we'll be able to stay focused and keep grinding. Um, game selection is also really, really, really key. Um, I think most players end up having an ego based around where if they have the money to play a certain game and they think they can beat it, or even they're certain they can beat it, they want to play. Um, and you know people do this all the time. Um, for instance, take a look at you know. <clears throat> for instance, you can even see this in something like say rounders. You know, Mike McDermott wants to play versus you know the the big game that's running in his local card room because he knows he can beat it. Um, but you know he isn't properly bankrolled for it, and you know. For all he knows, he's not even all that good in that game. He might barely have an edge. And if you barely have an edge and you're playing games that are near the higher end of your bankroll limits, you aren't going to do very well. Variance is almost always certainly going to make you pay for it. So don't just play what you can beat. You should also be playing what you are very well ruled for and what you're certain you can beat and which you can make the most from. So play games that, you know, if, you, if there's a $100 game that you think you will run a 15 to 20% ROI in, so make 15 to $20 per time you play it, that might not be a game you want to play when there are plenty of $50 games where you're certain you have a 40 to 60% ROI in. You know, you may be running a lower average buying and playing somewhat smaller games, but if you can make more per game or you're certain that you can make a similar amount per game, chances are you should stick to the smaller games for the most part. Of course, it is good to take shots and move up and um, try to build up your skill and play higher games as you're able to, but you just want to make sure that you are more conservative with it than not. Now I'm going to discuss the backing industry. <clears throat> um, many of you might not know how most backing deals work, and they work based off of makeup. And essentially what makeup is, is makeup is money that the horse, the person who is getting back, owes before they can profit out. So for instance, let's say I just started a backing deal and my backer sent me $5,000. And let's say I play 
an $11 average buy-in, and my first month I lose $1,500. <coughs> because I lost $1,500 from even, I'm now $1,500 in makeup. Now, in order for me to see a profit for this for the second month of play, I have to make back at least at $1,500. So my backer sends me $1,500 more, so I would essentially be $6,500 deep. Okay. And that second month of play, I win $3,000. So because I was $1,500 in makeup, I don't get half of $3,000. Instead, I get half of $1,500. So over those two months of play, the first month I lost $1,500. The second month I won $3,000. So I'm up $1,500 overall. So I would end up chopping out the 750 and my backer would get 750 and I would keep playing. Now let's say our deal continued and the third month I lost $2,000. I would once again dip back into makeup. I would now be, at the end of that month, I would be $2,000 deep in makeup. Um, essentially the makeup cycle continues and keeps constantly repeating itself. Um, as a back player, you're, you're almost always in makeup. It's pretty much guaranteed. If you're playing in most profitable deals, um, so essentially the horse has as little of their own money or profit at risk, um, you're essentially going to all, almost always be in makeup. As the moment you hit a substantial or any amount of profit or a substantial amount of profit, you should be splitting and taking them out your risk. Um, the upsides to being back essentially ends up coming down to not risking your own money. Um, and a lot of people have this myth, misconception that makeup means it's money that you owe. As in, if you quit the deal, you'd have to pay it back, which isn't necessarily true. Makeup itself is generally just based on play. The only time that makeup is no longer based on play is, let's say, you're back player and you're $15,000 in makeup and you want to just play poker on your own time, then you'd have to pay back the money that you lost. Um, some backers end up being willing to make concessions, allow a payment plan, or whatever. Now let's say though instead you were $15,000 deep and you wanted to just quick poker and not play the game anymore, you wouldn't owe a penny. Um, let's say you wanted to switch backers, you would have to try to convince your new backer to buy your makeup at a fair rate. Um, and if they weren't able to reach a deal, then you'd have to stick under your current backing deal. So the reason why a backing deal is good for a horse, even though say most backing deals you give up half of your profits, is not having to risk any of your own money pretty much ever. You know, if it wasn't for backing, I wouldn't be a professional poker player. You know, poker requires a lot of money to be a professional, um, to play it at uh, decent stakes. Um, there's a lot of variance involved, and life is also pretty expensive too. Um, so in order to build a bankroll consistently and be able to do things like move out of the country and pay rent and those kinds of things, it requires a ridiculously huge bankroll. And to be honest, there just aren't all that many people that can really afford to do that. So having someone who's willing to front you money and take the risk off your shoulders, that can be a very good deal for you and for them. So being back can be very, very, very plus EV. It can be very good value. Um, if you are interested in being backed or in backing others, 2 plus 2 is the best place to find backers, um, find horses, and to um, buy and sell action of someone. I guess I also should have added another point on this about buying and selling pieces of yourself. This is much more commonly done among, among people than full backing. Um, and this is the way it generally works. Let's say I wanted to play a $10,000 package at the World Series of Poker. So it's a mixture of 1Ks and 1500s and a, a 2K. Um, and let's say I thought that I felt that I could run a 50% ROI playing those games. 
So in order to prevent myself from losing value from playing this package that comes from selling the action, I decide to charge a markup. Now what a markup is, is I'm essentially convincing buyers that they that I deserve to be paid a premium to pay to play this package. So if I feel I have a 50% ROI, I'd probably try to sell the package at plus 1.25, which means a 25% markup. So if someone wanted to buy 10% of me, instead of it being $1,000, it'd end up being $1,250. That's a 25% markup. Now, USA Poker Sites. Um, the sites that I know of for the most part are Lock, um, Bovada, uh, the Merch Skins. Um, so yeah, I know there are a couple others, but they're pretty small. And to be honest, for the most part, I don't really trust very many of the USA sites. Um, I would only really keep money on there that I was very comfortable losing all of it, no matter what. Uh, Lock, I feel, seems to be one of the safer sites. They have one of the bigger prize pools, um, or player pools. Um, they seem to be fairly well ran. Um, and as far as merch skins go, the only merch skin that I'm like, very, very, very comfortable playing on would be Hero Poker. Um, Hero Poker, they have a thread in internet poker that's made by the CEO. Uh, the guy also posts on Reddit a lot. Um, my ex-backers met him before. Uh, the site pros that they have are very professional. So if, if I was in the USA and I was grinding, I would definitely just be playing on Hero Poker. You know, with all the issues with online grinding in the USA, um, with the sites that are currently out, it's pretty shady. And if you wanted to play poker professionally, well, being in the United States, doing it online would be pretty difficult at this point. Um, if you were serious about grinding a lot online and wanted to at least take a shot at doing it professionally, honestly, I would suggest that you try finding a backer and doing it. That way, at least if the sites end up going down, you aren't necessarily risking your own fun. The good news is, though, that at the rate that the current market in the United States seems to be heading with legality and such um, is that online poker should be operating in Nevada um, sometime in the next six months. Um, I know Caesars is going to be putting up sites. Um, all the major casinos are going to be getting in on it. Supposedly Zynga might be getting in on it. Um, so within six months, at least in Nevada, possibly California, um, and some other states are going to be hopping on and you should be seeing some pretty large player pools. Um, not like it was pre-Black Friday, but the amount of money that will be able to flow on and off due to people using their debit cards and you know Western Union and banks transfers and doing that, that kind of stuff to get money on and off, um, the game sh should then be a lot better. For it to be like it was pre-Black Friday, though, I would expect it to take at least one to two years, and maybe me? as long as five years from now. I think that there are really, really big differences between playing live poker professionally and playing online poker professionally. For instance, the bank rules required are entirely different as far as how much money you need for buy-ins. Um, you know, just the overall setting, the type of play required. Um, the only things that end up really staying the same are mindset-based, you know, can, as far as being focused, um, making sure that you have goals and playing lots of hours and are managing your money well, those kinds of things. Now when it comes to local cash games, um, most cash games that end up running pretty often at casinos end up being 1-2 no limit, 1-3 no limit, 2-5 no limit, 5-10 no limit, 10-25 no limit, 25-50 no limit. Um, it's going to be pretty rare to find games much bigger than 25-50. Um, 
for something like one two null null limit or one three null limit, I'd want to have a bankroll sized around five to ten thousand dollars. Know, for live cash games, I think it's pretty important that that you have at least twenty buy-ins. Um, I don't think it's really important to have more than fifty. But I do think it's really important to have more than 10 and to have at least 20. Um, just because for the most part, while you aren't going to have the amount of swings that you have online as far as having 10, 20, 50 buying down swings, you know, playing cash, I do think that it's pretty common to have a 5 to a 10 buying down swing. And especially near the bottom of that down swing, the places that you'll get mentally you know, you'll be off your game, you'll be tilted, those kinds of things. And thus it's really important to always have a cushion as far as making sure that pretty much no matter how bad you run, you'll still have a bankroll and be able to keep playing. I have a couple friends who live in Vegas and play poker professionally. And if you want to play tournaments in Vegas professionally, it's not going to happen. Um, it is the best place, at least in North America, to play terms as far as daily or weekly. And they do have pretty big series pretty often. You know, once every couple of months, one of the casinos will hold a series, uh, Venetian Deep Stack being the most well known and most popular as far as smaller local ones. Um, but the amount of break that the casinos take and the amount of volume that you're able to get into them. It really isn't feasible playing those specifically full time. However, if you wanted to mix in the better tournaments um, and sit goes while you're also cash grinding, that would definitely be a good thing to do. Now, if you wanted to play one two no limit, one three no limit, uh, or two five no limit there full time professionally, it was definitely feasible to do. Um, they have really good games running daily in many of the casinos that are 1-2 no limit through 5-10 no limit. Um, most of the 3-5 games or 2-5 or games are getting pretty difficult and any game that's 5-10 and higher tends to play pretty difficult. Um, and for those, instead of having a 20 buy-in bankroll, I'd want to have a 50 buy-in bankroll um, and be very certain that I game select really well as, um, as well. Um, the games in Vegas end up playing very, very, very deep, um, and the swings in them can be pretty brutal. And with Black Friday and such, the games have also gotten a lot harder than what they were just two, three years ago. Well, I do think that if you game select wisely um, and play a lot of hours and take as much advantage of comps and those kinds of things as you can, that you could play poker live professionally in Vegas pretty reasonably and make a decent amount of money at it as well. I would say for the most part though that grinding live professionally really isn't all that good of an option. Um, the only people it's going to be feasible for is essentially if you have a local game that's 2-5 or higher that runs consistently and that is soft enough for you to beat it consistently as well. Um, if you don't have that kind of specific option available and you don't have a very big bankroll to play it, playing live just isn't very feasible for very many people. Moving out of the USA. Um, in order to move out of the USA uh, to go to a place like Canada or Mexico, uh, it's pretty easy to do. For neither of them, you, you aren't required to apply for specific visas, you don't have to wait to go. Um, you do need passport for both of them, and when you do fly in, they do have you fill out paperwork, and you're generally limited to staying, um, and for each of them, you're generally limited to staying for six months. For Canada, that's a very, very uh, concrete six-month rule. For Mexico, it's not a very concrete six-month rule. Um, you can stay in Mexico pretty much as long as you like. Um, it's just that after six months, um, you tend to get charged a fee, I believe, of like $15 a day or something like that. 
Canada, if you stay longer than six months and their government finds out, um, you risk getting kicked out of uh, the country permanently, which you don't want to risk. Um, to get STARS set up, they just require for you to have a landline, so an actual phone. Um, they want you to have like a telephone bill for your apartment or wherever place you're staying at, a copy of your lease that is three months or longer. Um, they also want you to have a bank account set up in the country that you're residing in and all the paperwork and stuff uh, concerning that. Um, sometimes they'll even make you take a photo with you holding your passport um, with some landmark from wherever you're at so you prove that you're in their, your area. Now, essentially they have a pretty thorough uh, confirmation process that makes sure that you are actually where you state you are and that you have um, what it takes to live there for a long period of time. They're trying to prevent people from using VPNs and, or things like that and playing on stars from the United States. Um, it's not because they want to do it, it's because legally they have to do it, which really sucks for everyone. And I guess, you know, what it comes down to it is, you know, is it worth you know, is playing poker professionally and moving out of the USA, is it worth it? Well, it all comes down to, you know, your specific situation. Um, do you have the type of bankroll? Do you have the type of backer? Are you able to play a lot of volume? Um, you know, what are you giving up by moving outside the USA? Friends and family and those kinds of things. And if you honestly feel that moving out of the USA and playing poker professionally is what you really want to do, if that you can make a lot of money doing it and that you'll be happy doing it, then by all means, go ahead. Um, thank you all for watching my first video. I hope you found it very enjoyable and I hope you learned a lot from it. If you have any questions or comments, just post in the forums, PM me, 